I'm calling to order this meeting of the House uh, Committee on Children, Families, Finance, and Policy. Good morning to members and members of the public joining us. If you're joining us online, just a reminder that our meeting materials are posted on our website, and there's a lot of useful information there. We're going to start, as we always do, by having the clerk take the roll. Ms. Khan. Chair Pinto. Present. Vice Chair Keeler. Present. Lee Daniels. Present. Representative Bliss. Present. Representative Coulter. Present. Representative Davis. Present. Representative Hansen. Representative Hemmingson Yeager. Present. Representative Hicks. Present. Representative Hudson. Present. Representative Katiza Batoon. Present. Representative Lee. Present. Representative Nelson. Present. Representative Perez Vega. Present. Representative Zelesnikar. Present. We have a quorum. We have a quorum. Excellent. Um, so members, uh, we so we'll, we'll uh, handle minutes at a uh, next set of minutes at a future meeting. Um, we had received, I think it was at our most recent meeting, an overview of a portion of this committee's jurisdiction. This uh, morning, we're going to hear a presentation on the rest of that from House Research, and then presentation from our uh, terrific fiscal analysts on the accounts we have jurisdiction over. Um, we will be. Uh, receiving some updates from the Department of Human Services on some issues relating to uh, child care and early learning. And we will be uh, hearing and passing our first bill um, to make sure that people can eat um, and have food. Um, it's really important. So um, we will, um, and just to give a heads up, I'm thinking that I'll probably uh, have those two, those last two items flip in the order and we'll hear our committee overview and then we'll uh, move to House File 213 and then uh, hear those updates from DHS to end. Uh, any questions regarding the agenda at all from anybody? I'm not seeing anything. And so uh, we will start then. So a reminder to members and members of the public, we received a presentation on our early childhood jurisdiction from Ms. Mock uh, with House Research and our child protection jurisdiction from um, uh, Ms. Sunderman from House Research. And I say those names, especially for first-termers. These are folks you want to work with if you have proposals in those areas who can help you to put together bill, uh, bills. And so now we'll hear from uh, Ms. Pinelli regarding uh, the rest of our jurisdiction, and then we'll move to fis House Fiscal. So Ms. Pinelli, if you can please introduce yourself, yourself and proceed. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, Danielle Pinelli from the House Research Department. Um, and with me is Mr. Berg. Um, Mr. Chair and members, I, I just have one slide in this first part of the presentation. And um, as the chair mentioned, there is on the human ser services side of this committee, um, we didn't go through what our, we refer to as the DHS grant program. So if you look at slide two, which should be up, um, there, and I should just note there are sort of grants within grants. So the on this slide, which is a busy slide, I know I'm not gonna read each grant program, but the bolded ones are budget activities. So for instance, support services grants is a discrete budget activity that we appropriate to. Within it are, as you see, the MFIP consolidated support grants and the CFS injury protection grants and food stamp training grants. And uh, the numbers that are on here are just the 24, 25 general fund base. Um, you will see on some of them, it's noted that there are grants that are not in the general fund and those are just mostly their special revenue account uh, items. And so they're listed, but there isn't a base for them. And just broadly, we have the support services grants, which as I just mentioned, relates to MFIP and, and sort of related topics, food stamp employment and training, which has a biennial base for 24, 25 in the general fund of 17.4 million. We have chi child care development grants, uh, which has a biennial base of 3.5 million. And you'll see there are a number of smaller grants there related to child care development. Uh, children and Economic Support Grants, which has a base of 65.5 million and includes a lot of programs that are familiar to members on the Homeless Youth Act, Safe Harbor, Food Shelf Grants that we're gonna ad address later on uh, in this meeting, uh, Community Action Grants, that's a, a grant program that has a lot of things that members are uh, interested in. Um, child support enforcement grants, I'll note just briefly, is there is a $100,000 
general fund base, we put $50,000 a year in out of the general fund and that is all the activity finance wise that we do in this area. The rest of it you'll notice special revenue fund and is uh, largely I think uh, federal funds in there but not direct appropriated. At the top of the right hand column is another large program, Children's Services Grants, which has a base of 105 million, 104.7. Uh, and has the broadly a lot of child protection, child welfare, some uh, ICWA related items, Indian Child Welfare Act related items, uh, privatized adoption grants, a uh, whole uh, gamut of things that are related to sort of children's protection and related kinds of services. And uh, finally the Children and Community Services Grants which has a base of 121.7 million. And this is largely, uh, this is another one where, if you note the last two, the Red Lake Bands Human Services Initiative and the White Earth Human Services Initiative are just, I don't, they're grants that are, go out to the tribes so that they can run their own human services programs. Um, so, um, this collectively is, uh, you know, not a huge amount of money in our budget, but there are quite a few programs in here that relate to children and families. And, and so. Mr. Berg, uh, I'll just note for members, there's, um, there's some summary pages, sort of a couple pages each, that describe what are in each of these buckets. I mean, you, we're looking at these phrases, but then, you know, what exactly some of the phrases mean. And so I talked to Mr. Berg about pulling together for us. Uh, and these pages, I think, accompany the budget, like when there's a budget forecast in November. Uh, and so I've asked Mr. Berg to pull together those summary pages and provide them to us with sort of a description of what is in each of these buckets. Mr. Berg, if you want to comment yeah, on that. Yeah, Mr. Chair, they're, they're actually part of the, the governor's budget. It's called the base budget narrative. Um, later this week, sometime later today or tomorrow, I will send an email out to the committee with the narrative pages for all the human services accounts within our jurisdiction, which have, as the chair mentions, it's not as, it doesn't list each grant or anything like that, but it talks about broadly the grants, what their purpose is, some benchmarks for quality, who they serve, that kind of thing, which is good background information. Um, the governor's budget rollout is starting very soon uh, and we'll get specific recommendations that accompany those pages. Okay, thank you. So members, so that'll be coming to us. Um, so we will then move to Ms. Pinelli. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, again, Danielle Pinelli from the House Research Department. I am just going to go through um, the remainder of the programs that you have in your jurisdiction that we didn't go over last week. Uh, the first program that I'm going to talk about is the Minnesota Family Investment Program, or MFIP. Uh, this is what is typically thought of as Minnesota's welfare program. It is a state supervised county administered program. The Department of Human Services is the primary executive branch agency that oversees MFIP. DHS supervises program administration, ensures compliance with federal requirements, and provides training and technical assistance to counties. While the counties administer the program on the local level, accepting applications, determining client eligibility, contracting with local service providers and referring clients to services. Um, MFIP is designed to provide income assistance to low income families. In order to be eligible, a family must have a minor child or a pregnant woman in the household. Assistance includes both cash and food assistance, as well as employment and training services and related support services and transitional services. Uh, Minnesota must meet the federal temporary assistance to needy families laws and regulations, but it does have a considerable amount of flexibility uh, over the design of the program here in Minnesota. Uh, TANF regulations limit assistance to 60 months. However, there are certain exceptions and exemptions. Um, the legislature may enact provisions that go beyond the minimum federal requirements and uh, policies that are set by the legislature are often influenced by federal requirements that are prerequisites to receiving the federal funding. Uh, this next slide shows 
the maximum cash portion, food portion, and the full assistance standard for various family sizes. Uh, MFIP applicants must meet an initial income test that excludes certain items from income. In general, a family is eligible for MFIP if their income after all applicable deductions are made is below the MFIP income standard for a family of like size. The earned income disregard is equal to the first $65 of earned income plus one half of remaining earned income per month. Um, in addition, the county then adds all of the family's unearned income that is not otherwise excluded. The county compares the result to the applicable MFIP standard. If the result is at or below the standard, then the family is eligible for MFIP. Um, and in general, a family is ineligible once their income rises above about 130% of the federal poverty guidelines. Uh, in order to be eligible for MFIP, a family also needs to meet um, an asset standard, which is the equity valuable value of a personal property that must not exceed $10,000 for applicants and participants. And personal property is limited to cash, bank accounts, liquid stocks and bonds that can be readily accessed without a financial penalty, non-excluded vehicles, and the full value of business accounts that are used to pay expenses not related to the business. Um, and I'd just like to point out these asset limits are the same as several other income assistance programs that are administered by the Department of Human Services. Um, and this is something that was done in fiscal years, I believe 2015 and 2016. Um, it was a county initiative to simplify the public assistance programs. Um, so a lot of the standards, they tried to make the same across programs. And Ms. Spinelli, the, the, uh, the reference to equity value, does that, that would mean, I suppose, that if, uh, if, if somebody has a partial ownership interest because the rest is indebted or something, can you just explain what that what the addition of the word equity for equity value? Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd have to look at the statute and get back to you on okay. that. I, I'm just curious about that. I was, um, okay, yeah, if you can, when you get a chance, thanks. Another, and then a question from Representative Katiza Wittoon. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and thank you so much for this presentation. I think, um, just just out of curiosity, you know, when we're, um, when we're talking about $10,000 of, of personal property, and so you said that that's, cash in a savings account that's like any term of like any any type of retirement savings or something that they've like managed to to put away it just it seems really low to me and i know that you know in the united states we're not a nation of savers um which has been proven and, and born again over and over and over again and we've done some great work in um in mr chair's previous committee early childhood on on helping underfunded folks really begin a savings account and so i think i'm just curious um if there is data and, and if i'm uh jumping the gun a little bit early that you might be touching on that. I'm just curious the, the the sheer number of Minnesotans who kind of do fall under this and not the not the percentage of the poverty line, but just, I mean, in general, so we can really ground ourselves in how we can educate people on the importance of saving and, and how we can help them get started on that. Ms. Bonelli. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Katiza Watoon, um, I do have a slide coming up here where I show uh, the number of monthly average recipients. Um, and we've also got some other programs I'm gonna go through later on in the presentation uh, that talk about um, financial capability. Okay, thank you. And, and, and Ms. Bonelli, um, Representative Cassidy's return reference, cash and bank accounts, et cetera. But you said, also said like vehicles count. I mean, there's a number of other things too that count against the 10,000, so it's even lower than. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah, please continue. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, this next slide shows for fiscal year 2022 the number of recipients and both state and federal expenditures for the MFIT program. This next slide uh, is related to support services grants, which are largely provided through the MFIP Consolidated Fund. Uh, these grants provide 
employment services to people receiving benefits under MFIP and the Federal Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Um, and some of the services provided include job search, job placement, training, and education. These services are delivered by workforce centers, counties, tribes, and community agencies. Um, the service provider will evaluate the needs of each participant and develop an individualized employment plan um, for each person. And a portion of these funds um, are also used to fund um, county and tribal costs of administering MFIP and the diversionary work program. Ms. Pinelli, can you describe what the diversionary work program is? I don't see it on a future slide, so this is maybe a good time to do that. Uh, Mr. Chair, sure. The diversionary work program is, um, I think of it as sort of a sub-program underneath MFIP. Um, typically when a family applies for MFIP, um, a, lo a lot of those families before being placed on MFIP will be put in the diversionary work program, which is supposed to be more of an intensive um, time limited, it's four months long program to get a family employed and working so that maybe they don't need to go on MFIP at all. Okay, thank you. Yeah, please continue. Uh, the next set of services I'm going to go through are the nutrition services that are administered by the Department of Human Services. Um, there's food support, Minnesota Food Shelf Program, and the Emergency Food Assistance Program. Uh, the largest of these is the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, which is a, a federally funded program that's operated by the U.S. Department of Agriculture that provides food assistance to low-income families. Um, the assistance may be used to purchase federally authorized food and food products. Monthly benefits are provided through an electronic benefit transfer card and the maximum monthly allotment for a family of three is currently about $740 a month, I believe. Um, Minnesota also operates a much smaller Minnesota food assistance program that provides food assistance to certain individuals that are not eligible for the federal SNAP program. Uh, the Minnesota Food Shelf Program provides funds to about 300 Minnesota food shelves to purchase food and fund operating and administrative expenses of food shelves. Uh, the Department of Human Services contracts with Hunger Solutions to allocate funding to food shelves across the state under this grant program. And the final program on this slide is the Emergency Food Assistance Program, which distributes USDA donated food commodities to individuals who use on-site meal programs, food shelves, and shelters. The Emergency Food Assistance Program fund, um, funds cover costs associated with warehousing, transporting, tracking, and allocating these commodities. And again, DHS contracts with Hunger Solutions to allocate these USDA food commodities based on population and poverty data. Uh, this next slide goes over a couple of financial capability services programs. Uh, the first one is community action agency grants, um, which provide programs designed to address community needs and increase the economic security of Minnesotans. Um, and then there's also the Family Assets for Independence program or the FAME program, which helps low-income Minnesotans increase their savings and build financial assets. The FAME program combines matched savings accounts with personal finance education, asset-specific training, and ongoing coaching. Participants receive a financial match at a rate of three to one for each dollar of earned income deposited um, up to a certain lifetime limit. And then the funds can be used to purchase a home, pursue post-secondary education, or to capitalize a small business. Uh, Mr. Chair, the next set of programs are programs for people experiencing homelessness. These include the emergency services grants, transitional housing, the Homeless Youth Act, and long-term homeless supportive services. 
um, emergency services grants provide homeless persons essential service services and emergency shelter. These grants are awarded on a competitive basis and provide emergency shelter, motel vouchers, day shelter and essential services to children, unaccompanied youth, single adults and families who are experiencing homelessness. The transitional housing program provides housing for a homeless person or family at a rental rate of 25% of family income for a period of up to 36 months. Transitional housing may also include up to six months of follow-up support services for persons who complete transitional housing as they stabilize in permanent housing. The Homeless Youth Act provides street outreach, drop-in programs, emergency shelter programs, and integrated supportive housing and transitional living programs for homeless youth and youth at risk of homelessness. The Homeless Youth Act provides services to people who are 24 years of age or younger, who are unaccompanied by a parent or guardian, and without shelter where appropriate care and supervision are available. Uh, for people whose parent is unable or unwilling to provide shelter and care, or for people who lack a fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence. And finally, long-term homeless supportive services provide integrated services to stabilize individuals, families, and youth who are living in supportive housing. Homeless, uh, long-term homeless supportive services are for people who have lacked a permanent place to live continuously for one year or more, or for at least um, four times in the past three years. And Mr. Chair, the final program that I'm going to go through is child support enforcement. Uh, federal law requires each state to establish a child support enforcement program and sets broad standards and requirements for those programs. The federal government provides uh, TANF and child support enforcement funding to states with child support systems that meet federal requirements. Uh, the federal match is equal to 66% of county and state child support enforcement spending, and the Minnesota legislature has established child support policy within federal parameters, and I believe the statute that governs our child support enforcement program is in um, Minnesota statutes chapter 518C. So the Department of Human Services is responsible for oversight of the child support system which counties administer. In fiscal year 2021, Minnesota collected and dispersed child support totaling approximately $551 million. Um, and for every $1 spent, DHS collected $3.09 in child support and for more details on the Child Support Enforcement Program, DHS publishes an annual Child Support en Enforcement Report that's available on their website. Um, Ms. Benelli, thank you. That was terrific. Um, are there questions that members have at this time? And again, remembering that our House Research staff is available on each of these topic areas. Not seeing any, so we're moving to Mr. Oh, I'm sorry, um, Representative Davis. Pardon me. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. No problem. Um, I just have a, a quick question on programs for people experiencing homelessness. The transitional housing part. You said that they could be on it for up to 36 months, and let's say they they uh, do, do they get on it for 36 months, and and then they find their way to um, providing for themselves, and then fall on hard times again. Um, I'm wondering. Uh, is there a time that has to pass uh, before they can get back on that program or can they get back on that program like immediately? Ms. Benelli. Uh, Mr. Chair, my recollection is there's no time in between, but I'd have to go back and check. If you can look into that as well, that would be really great. Representative Davis, okay, good, got that covered. And then Representative Keeler had a question as well. Thank you for this. My question is on page seven regarding the um, job search, job placement, training, and education. 
Um, I think that that's really good, right? Because if we're going to provide services, we are, we have to provide a path back to some sort of um, sustainability. My question is, what's the average distance that a Minnesotan would have to drive to be able to participate in some of these? Are they brick and mortar centers that you actually have to physically get to? Is it an online format? Um, again, from a greater Minnesota perspective, if we're having to drive a far distance through horrible weather just to receive these services, that's a disadvantage. Ms. Benelli. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Keeler, I don't know the answer to that. I, that'd probably be a better question for someone from the Department of Human Services. Okay. If there's somebody who is able to, who happens to know that, you may or may not leave up. If you don't, that's okay. Uh, oh, you know what? Representative Hicks, uh, I believe, may be able to help answer that question. Those uh, programs are all administered through the Career Force website or the Career Force centers throughout the state. And so every where those are is based on county so you can google them and do we happen to know representative hicks if those how how many are, are how many of those there are i don't okay um and so we'll see if um so if somebody leaps up that's great but otherwise what we might ask is if uh we can get some um uh get some follow-up information from department of human services if you're watching and Ms. Pinelli, maybe you can help make sure that we do get an answer to that uh, do you have, have something further Ms. Pinelli, on that or uh, Mr. Chair, not not really. I was just conferring with Mr. Berg, and um, my recollection is that for the workforce centers, there are only around 35 of those across the state, but I'd have to double check that number. Big state, so okay. I'm um, good. If we, if we can get that follow-up information from from somebody who's watching, and Ms. Manelli, if you can help make sure to do that. So we've got a couple items of homework here. Um, Representative Lesnikar had a question. Thank you, Chair Pinto. And thank you. My question is related also to following up on page seven, and I'm glad that we have the job search and the career force centers, um, if there's 35 in the state. My question is, do we have any data that tracks the job search, job placement, and, and types of education that are offered to people? I guess I'm referencing we have a severe shortage in long-term care and, and child care centers. And so if if I'm curious as to what systems we have in place to track how we're monitoring um, the job search, the job placement, frequency of applying for, for placement, because we know we have openings across the state. Thank you. Sure, and Ms. Pinelli, I wonder if that may be something that <laughs> also need to direct to the department, but Ms. Pinelli, can you help with that at all? Do you know? Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Zaleznikar, um, I believe DHS does do a lot of, of tracking of these types of things. I think they, they have to do a certain amount of tracking for, um, in order to meet federal requirements. But as far as the level of detail goes, I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, I'd have to talk to someone at DHS about that. You know, we, I might be inclined to do represents Lesnikar and, and everybody is. Uh, maybe I'll, I can, uh, we can have DHS come in and do a presentation specifically on this program area. There seems to be a lot of interest and be able to answer questions uh, regarding that. So get a thumbs up and thanks for representing Nelson. Thank you. Yeah, Thank good. You. Yeah, I think that would be, I think there's interest in, in uh, among all members for that. So uh, DHS be on the, be on the lookout. I guess uh, Ms. Sommerfeld and Ms. Colburn can work with, work with them on that. Um, so good. So uh, want to move on if we can. I don't see any other hands anyway. So Mr. Berg, uh, if you can just walk through the, the accounts and Ms. Uh, Beckel, um, and we'll keep uh, keep moving. And so please, uh, whomever is going to go first, uh, uh, Ms. Beck, I'll introduce yourself, please, and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Solvay Beckel from House Fiscal Analysis. Uh, before we proceed with the spreadsheet, um, I used to cover the jobs and economic development area. So I did just want to comment that uh, Career Force is covered by the, um, is run by the Minnesota Department of uh, um, employment and economic development um, and I just took a quick look there are 139 career force locations around the state and there is career force anywhere which has online options um, it, for it, it, and Ms. Bethel, can you confirm? And that is that is as Representative Hicks said, that is the the system though that somebody who's involved in these employment services through DHS would be connecting with. Is that right? Correct. The agencies okay, worked. Oh, that's there. good. All right. Well, that's very helpful. Thank you. Yes. 
Yeah. Um, but yes, let's proceed with the spreadsheet. Uh, many of you have seen uh, spreadsheets in other agencies, um, but I just want to mention a few things um, looking at spreadsheets. Um, we typically use all numbers in thousands when we're using our um, committee spreadsheets. Um, also, I want to point out at the top of all of the columns that have letters, um, it says November forecast, except for columns D and H. That is just me telling you what data I'm using. Our most current data um, is from the November forecast. When the February forecast is released, we will be updating these spreadsheets to give you that most current data. Um, the change um, on D and H shows the change from the November forecast um, from the end of session forecast. Um, so a number of these programs here um, do change with each forecast. That's because they are forecasted programs. Um, so they are tied not to just um, appropriations that the legislature makes, but tied to some other factors such as enrollment or um, pupil counts um, for education. But I will now just go down. So for early education, this committee has a number of items in its purview. On line three, developmental screening aid. Um, and Mr. Chair, would you like me to list the amounts for each biennium as I go through? No, no, thank you, okay. Ms. Beckel. Okay. Um, Thanks for asking. Line four, early childhood family education aid. As you'll note here, those items are underlined. Um, at the bottom of the page, I have um, underlined equals a shifted program. In education programs, some items are funded 90% in the current year, and then 10% as a, what we call cleanup payment, 10% um, of the previous year's entitlement. Um, so just know when I say shifted program, that means that they are getting 90% of their current year entitlement, and then 10% of the previous fiscal year's entitlement. Uh, moving on. Uh, Line five, early childhood programs at tribal schools. Line six, early learning scholarships. That is appropriated through the Minnesota Department of Education, but then transferred to the special revenue fund. So that money does not cancel at the end of the biennium, but remains in the special revenue fund. Line seven, the Educate Parents Partnership. Line eight, the Head Start Program. Line nine, home visiting aid, which is again shifted. Ten. Kindergarten Entrance Assessment Program, 11, the Parent Child Plus Program, line 12, the Quality Rating and Improvement System. This again is appropriated to the Minnesota Department of Education, but then is transferred to the Department of Human Services um, for use. And then finally, the school readiness program. Now these lines notably do not include voluntary pre-kindergarten or the school readiness plus program, which is different from the school readiness program. Those items both receive funding through the general education formula allowance. Um, and that money is in the per under the purview of the K through 12 um, education finance committee, um, even though obviously those items pertain to uh, pre-K uh, funding. Uh, and then I'm going to pass the uh, spreadsheet over to Mr. Berg. Mr. Berg. Uh, and Mr. Chair and members, the <coughs> in the lower section of the spreadsheet the labeled human services <coughs> are the human services programs. Um, I'll go fast because a few of them I went through just a couple minutes ago. And, and we're uh, getting a little bit tight on timing. Too. The That'll be first helpful. three programs there, I will note, are forecasted programs um, relative to Ms. Peckle's comment about forecasted versus fixed appropriations. So the Minnesota Family Investment Program, Diversionary Work Program, uh, MFIP Child Care, and North Star Care for Children, which handles adoption, kinship assistance, uh, and uh, the like. Um, below that is our uh, couple programs that members of this committee in the previous biennium will remember, the basic sliding fee child care uh, grants uh, and child care development grants. 
And then the next uh, s five are the ones that I just went through previously, child support enforcement grants, children's services, children and community services, and children and economic support grants. And then um, new to this committee this year is the Ombudsman for Family, Ombudsperson for Families, which has been around for a while. The Ombudsperson for American Indian Families, which is a new office that was split off from the Ombudsman for Families two years ago um, and is now an independent office uh, doing the same things but strictly for American Indian families. And then finally, uh, last year the legislature created a new Ombudsperson for Foster Care Youth which is in its first year of existence and uh, is under this committee's purview. Thank you, Mr. Berg. Members, I'm inclined to keep, um, keep moving here because we've got a bunch of things going on. Mr. Berg and Ms. Becca will be available um, to all of us, and this is a good um, overview. I think this is a terrific sheet that we should be hanging on to, uh, and I know that we will be. So I'm going to uh, ask my vice chair to head up to the front, and thank you so much to both of you. Um, and uh, so we are going to bring up a House file um, 213, and um, Representative Keeler um, moves that House File 213 be recommended for re-referral to the Committee on Ways and Means as she's getting settled in. And so, um, Representative Keeler, welcome to the testifier table. And uh, so again, uh, your motion is to have House File 213 be recommended for re-referral to the Committee on Ways and Means. That is your motion, yes? <laughs> yes, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. So um, uh, with that, please present uh, your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, I want to start by just grounding us on what, what um, food insecurity looks like in Minnesota. I think it's one of those things that often we kind of forget about, but just to ground us, I want to make sure that we know one in 12 of our neighbors in Minnesota have experienced food insecurities. Um, I learned this firsthand when I went through my master's program and I did my practicum work around what are the barriers to academic success outside of academic rigor. So I wasn't asking families, is math hard or is science hard? I was asking what life issues were standing in your way from success. And food insecurity came up over and over and over and over. And it wasn't the typical families that we think that we see that are struggling. These are all Minnesotans across the board. Um, one in eight kids don't have access to food. And I'm willing to bet all of us either ate something, packed a lunch, or prepared some sort of meal plan for today. Because we as adults all know that when we're hungry, we're hangry, and when we're hangry, we're not as functional as we could be um, in the work that we're doing. And so food is the fuel to success in Minnesota. Um, also noting that our elders, our 60 plus population, is the fastest growing group that's actually utilizing food shelves. Um, as we know that, that is a, that's a large growth population. And um, they have limited resources, limited access. Um, and really they're a population that needs nutritious food on a very regular basis. Um, and almost half of these individuals are actually utilizing these assistance programs for the very first time. Um, I've been taking my 16-year-old to go into volunteer at food shelves ever since he was old enough to walk. And I've seen this, the embarrassment that comes across people's faces because they have to show up here um, to ask for food or to be able to have food to provide for their kids. Um, and so that I just want to ground us in what, what food insecurities look like across Minnesota and also to let you know that we went over all of these programs but actually um, one in three that utilize food shelves are actually uneligible for some of these programs so it's not that they're missing out on opportunities they're in that like working poor gap is what I call it that they're doing their best um, they're just having a hard time making ends meet when we have a hard time making ends meet um, our food is usually the first place that's a struggle we know with in cost prices um, or increase in prices that's an issue and so I'm not going to take up much more time what this bill does um, it's a very simple bill, it's House File 213, it's appropriating $5 million in emergency funding to make sure that our food shelf programs can keep food on the shelves for the rest of the cycle. Um, we know what the increased cost. One of the data points that's really interesting to me is that over the past year, the price of milk they purchased increased 30%, while the increase for milk um, was increased by 40%. So the math tells you that we need more money and more funding uh, for all of Minnesota. So with that, Mr. Chair, I'll hand it over to my testifiers. And, and please introduce yourself, uh, share your preferred pronouns if you're comfortable, and, uh, and proceed. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, <clears throat> my name is Colleen Moriarty, and I'm the Executive Director at Hunger Solutions Minnesota, and I use she, her. 
Um, I am here today really to talk about a crisis situation. We averted this crisis during the pandemic because there were federal supports that supported families. Um, and there were a number of generous individuals throughout our state who contributed greatly to making sure that people had enough to eat. The reason that we didn't experience the long lines at food banks is that we have a robust system of meeting these needs in the state of Minnesota. We have over 300 food shelves. You know the food shelves in your local community. You know who it is that the people in your local community look to for food assistance. But as those uh, supports peeled off and people um, found themselves in emergency situations needing food and with no support there, um, the visits to food shelves increased and increased and increased. And we, we now have uh, this year by um, the end of November, um, there were 5,285,299 visits. And you have this one pager, I think, that was distributed. Um, that we put together, that's a million four more visits than there were last year to the food shelves. That coupled with the fact that the, the um, ability to acquire food for everyone, including the food shelves and the food banks and others, is just as expensive for them as it is for those of us who go to the grocery store and are fortunate enough to be able to purchase our own food. But we experienced the sti sticker shock you can imagine the sticker shock on a very large basis at all these community agencies located throughout the state of Minnesota. So we, we, accept, we expect that considering the December numbers, we will see two million more visits to food shelves this year than we did last year. Um, the food shelf grant right now is at $1.6 million uh, a year. It's not, a, you know, it's, it's not going to knock over the state budget, but I can tell you that the reports to us from those food shelves throughout the state, from people who use them, and from people who call our helpline that functions in every, um, every uh, county in the state of Minnesota is desperate. There isn't enough food. There isn't food on the, the shelves. The ability to acquire food like milk and eggs and protein products is greatly exaggerated by the food inflation costs, and they need help now. They, couple that with the fact that in March, the last emergency payment will go out on SNAP, and then we don't even know what the effect of that will be. But we know right now two million more visits is many more times the ability of a f local food shelf to be able to handle that. They need your assistance, and they really need that assistance now. That's why we're urging you to support this bill and help to distribute money to, throughout the state so that they can purchase food at the food bank, at, the, um, you know, at, at other kinds of wholesale prices so that they can be able to feed the public who desperately need your help. Thank you, Ms. Moriarty. Um, can you explain, or maybe Representative Keeler can, how the $5 million was calculated, just how that number was, was developed? We looked at the increase, we coupled in the inflation numbers, and then we, um, we um, looked at the, the deciding, the factor that decides how much a food shelf gets is on their visits. Mm -hmm. So you're going to hear from a, a testifier after me that the, mm -hmm. the visits are 30 to 40 percent higher than they were the previous year. Um, with people visiting food shelves, so we arrived at the five million dollars. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so it does sound like there's. Oh, Representative Keeler. I would just add that referring back to the statute that this requires. Um, there is a standard food requirement that would consist that every time somebody visits a food shelf, they would be required to receive at least two days supply or six pounds per person of nutritious balanced food. Um, so we're not, I mean, that that's in statute that we have to be able to give that amount um, of nutritious food out. And so that's just helping us get to the gap to make sure that we're fitting into the statute requirements. Thank you. Thank you. So it does sound like there's a second testifier that you have, Representative Keeler. I might ask whomever that is to keep it real short if you yeah. can, because we're, uh, we're getting pretty tight on time here. But uh, please, if you can introduce yourself, again, share your pronouns if you're, if you're comfortable, and then, and then proceed with your testimony. Good morning, Chair and Committee members. My name is Mary McEwen, and I'm the President and CEO of Keystone Community Services, a nonprofit organization that supports uh, families, youth, and children, uh, and seniors here in Ramsey County. As Colleen mentioned, visits to food shelves have increased dramatically across the state, and this increase has left organizations like Keystone scrambling to have enough resources to support this significant increase in visitors and additionally manage the higher costs that inflation has brought to all businesses including nonprofits like ours. 
Higher food prices have compounded the challenges that food shelves are experiencing. More visits mean we need to purchase more food, which is now 8 to 10 percent more expensive than in the past. At Keystone, that meant we had to dip into reserves to manage a 30 percent increase in our food budget. For my colleague Dom Corbell at Community Pathways in Owatonna, they had to double their food budget, food budget also using reserves, which means their reserves have dipped to a critical level. The number of new people who have visited food shelves in 2022 across Minnesota is staggering. Both Community Pathways and Keystone have, have seen visits by new people nearly triple in 2022 compared to 2021. The majority of these new visitors are working people whose monthly budgets went up 8 to 10 percent, but their salaries did not. Car repairs, unrespect, unexpected job loss, child care are the reasons people are coming to Keystone and organizations like Community Pathways. They simply can't keep up. Household budgets that worked at the beginning of 2021 before inflation took hold no longer work for people in Minnesota. And 2023 has started out as both record months for Keystone and uh, Community Pathways. We typically support 200 families a day at our two food shelves in a mobile distribution. And just last week uh, at our food shelf that we operate just north of here on Rice Street, we supported 140 families in one day. Uh, in 2021, Community Food Pathways has, has supported over 250 shoppers a week. They're now supporting 600 shoppers a week. Both our organizations have doubled the number of people we're serving in 2022, and we expect this trend to continue in 2023. As Representative Keeler mentioned, asking for help is really hard. And Keystone and other organizations like ours are trusted organizations in the neighborhood where neighbors can help neighbors, and they know they can come to us support, and so they've been coming. I'm asking for your help. We need more support now to help us continue to provide the support for thousands of Minnesotans. Uh, and as she also mentioned, having enough food in your household means you can be a better employee, you can be a better parent, better student, or a healthier, older adult. The emergency five million will help us keep food on our food shelves without jeopardizing the long-term future of our neighbors and community organizations like Keystone. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. McEwen. Um, and are there any members of the public who wish to testify on the bill? Just ask that. And so um, we move to member uh, discussion or questions. Um, Representative Lesnikar. Thank you, Chair Pinto. My question is, um, I totally understand the importance of the food shelves in all of our communities. Northern Minnesota is struggling, um, and so is the state. I'm curious as to, with the food shelf system, is there tracking systems, or is it an honor system? And do we know if the people coming in are people currently on the SNAP program, or is it people that are not meeting eligibility to what you alluded to? Or is it just simply an honor system where we come in, if you could answer that? Uh, Ms. Moriarty. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, um, the um, numbers of visits of food shelves are tracked by uh, and reported on a monthly basis through the food banks to us so that we have the, the data that we need at working with the state to be able to distribute the funds. The question of eligibility, if someone is <coughs> receiving commodities, which many people, you know, most people who are visiting food shelves are getting commodities, they do have to sign a waiver that says that they are under 200 percent of poverty. Um, so there is that verification. Also, there are um, most people who are existing a life of SNAP and food shelves couple those two programs together, frankly. And, you know, it, the SNAP allocations, once we are out of the emergency um, program, will go back to previous levels, which means in many cases seniors might get $16 a month. So visiting the food shelves is a way to make it through the month. Um, there are the eligibility questions really uh, exist around the, the qualifications for TFAP. And Representative Zalesnikar. Thank you, Chair Pinto. I just have a follow-up. I thank you for that information. That was what I suspected is likely happening. I, on the presentation, it, it talks about the rapid and uh, rapid rise in food costs. And I think, um, while I support this, I also think it's important for all of us as members to realize cause and effect. You know, I'm, I grew up on a farm. Where is our food coming from? What are the impacts for farmers right now? How, what is driving food costs when even I go to the grocery store, the, shel the shelves aren't full. 
Right. And, and I hear that from constituents across the state of Minnesota. So I think we need to look at, you know, what is causing this? How do we move our food? It's trucking. Um, how do the trucks have fuel to, to process food across the state? And I think, you know, the, when you see prices of eggs at, at what they are at, um, uh, growing up on a farm, they sure weren't, were not what they are today. And two years ago, they were not. So we need to look at the methods and how we're shipping food, which requires trucking, and come back to some common sense on how we're going to do things, because it is affecting everyday uh, Minnesotans and how they have, what, how much money they have for their children, for sports and food, to pay for food. And so it isn't just people on programs, it's everybody that's, every senior, every child, every middle income American is facing decisions on what they're going to pay for. And food has got to be essential. And food is a big bucket right now. Um, if you're raising kids and you have teenagers, you know how much they eat. They need protein. They need meat. They need to have um, uh, milk and eggs and all those great things. But it is a big issue. And so um, funding this program is 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 an effect, but we got to look at the cause. So I urge members to re to, to remember that um, our stuff is coming from farmers. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Lisnikar. Um, we've got Representatives Coulter and Katiza. We want to ask you to keep it really quick, if you can. Representative Coulter. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, um, I just wanted to make sure I'm understanding that the the funding in this bill this goes directly to food distribution programs. I know, yes. for example, Veep is in my district, yeah. and they also offer educational programs and so on. But the funding in this bill specifically, as I read statute, it specifically does have to go to food distribution, that whatever else any nonprofit may do, that that funding can't be used for those other programs. Am I understanding that correctly? Absolutely. Right. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Thank that you. is right. It is Thank distributed you. through OEO which is the Department of Human Services, to us, distribute directly to those three, over 300 food shelves in the state of Minnesota. Thank you. And Thank that you. Office of Economic Opportunity was within Children and Families. Representative Katiza Wittun. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I, and I will try to be brief. Um, I, uh, I wanted to also um, just say thank you to Representative Keeler for, for um, authoring this bill. I think um, it's it's critical. I mean, we know that there are so many folks who are hungry across the state of Minnesota. And to your, um, you know, to your comment about being hangry, I, I certainly feel the effects of that some days. And so I think we should all do our best to make sure we have a snack before um, going on the floor. So maybe our, <laughs> help our debate be a little bit more friendly. Um, but I did just want to say, um, so my, my predecessor here at the Minnesota House, Representative Jennifer Loon, is now the executive director at uh, People Reaching Out to People Food Shelf in Eden Prairie and serves Eden Prairie and Chanhassen. And I think this is a really... Um, really great example of how we can do really good bipartisan work for the people of Minnesota. Um, and I think that, you know, we need to, we need to take care, um, to, you know, certainly consider the, the impact and kind of how, how things um, stack up and kind of create this, this issue for folks across Minnesota. But I think um, it, we, need to, we need to ensure that that doesn't hinder the good work that we can do. So regardless of what has potentially caused some of the food incre increases. Um, and I do want to shout out to the Attorney General's office as well, because we've had some issues with price gouging, particularly on the cost of eggs. Um, and I think that uh, the Attorney General's office is doing some great work there. Um, we just heard a bill to, to ban price gouging in commerce last week. Um, so there's a lot of good bipartisan work that we can do to support folks. And I think this is a really simple I vote for everybody, hopefully. Thank you, Representative Katiza Wittum. Um, so Representative Keeler, you get the last word on your bill. Thank you. Um, we have an opportunity today to make a difference, um, though I think all of us would love to stop inflation, you know, have more licensed CDL drivers, make sure that we have more opportunities for community farming so that we can get nutritious things to our plate. And I believe that we can all work on that. Um, I, I remember real clearly about 10 years ago, I sat as an Indian education liaison and I had a child in front of me who was really struggling. And he looked me straight in the face and said, Miss Heather, what would you do if you didn't know where you were gonna get your next meal or where you were gonna sleep? And I think that we have to remember that when we don't know where our next meal is coming from or we don't know where we're gonna sleep, we just cannot thrive as Minnesota needs to. And so. Um, I just encourage us to look at this. This is a need that needs to happen now. This is something that impacts all of our communities um, and all of your constituents would appreciate a yes vote. Thank you all. Thank you so much and thanks to your testifiers for the work that they do to keep Minnesotans fed because that's nothing more fundamental than that. Thank you. Um, so with that, Representative Keeler renews her motion that House File 213 be recommended for re-referral to the Committee on Ways and Means. All in favor of that motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? So hearing none, that motion. Thank <laughs> you.
passes, and we have thank a bill that's passed. Thank you, thank you so much uh, to the testifiers, um, and thank you, Representative Keeler, again. So I'll ask uh, the staff from the um, uh, Department of Human Services, uh, uh, I think Office of Inspector General, up first. Um, and I really appreciate your patience uh, as we've been shifting things around. Um, I'll ask you to please, uh, and I should just, uh, just to set a, a tiny bit of context, uh, members in 2019, uh, the legislature passed uh, a number of reforms to integrity in the uh, child care assistance program, um, quite a lot of things. And so what, uh, in the committees I've been chairing, we've had every year, we've had an update on that work. Um, and it's been quite, uh, quite good to, to see that. And we all wanna make sure that funds are being um, used to take care of, uh, take care of kids. And and um, so really appreciate you coming back for another year for yet another update on that. And so please, if you can introduce yourself, um, your preferred pronouns, if you're comfortable with that, and proceed with your, uh, with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Kulani Moti, and I serve as the Inspector General at the Minnesota Department of Human Services, and I use she, her, hers pronouns. Um, before I go into my testimony, I do want to introduce some of the um, staff that we do have here today. We're Please actually go. doing an update on um, two of our divisions within the Office of Inspector General. Sitting next to me is our Legislative Director, Autumn Baum, for the OIG, as well as I have our um, Interim Deputy Inspector Gen General, Tom Johnson, for our Financial Fraud abuse and investigations division which covers our program integrity services uh, deputy inspector general Alyssa Dotson over our licensing area and then um, I do have our CCAP provider investigations manager Chris Clifford who oversees our CCAP um, provider program integrity services and then um, our interim legislative policy analyst Glennis Buckingham um, and then we have um, our licensed leg legislative policy manager, Larry Hosh, who we'll hear from in a few minutes um, after I've done about some of our licensing activities, as well as legislative policy analysts, Catherine DiBenetto and Karen Kunze. So there's just some of the few people that we have here today as we do some of our updates. Um, so we'll go to our first slide. Uh, CCAP, investi uh, CCAP program allows or helps low-income families pay for childcare so that children are well cared for, it, as you all know. And CCAP provider investigation's role is to ensure that program funds are being appropriately used to the benefit of eligible children and families. And we oversee compliance for 4,500 childcare providers who receive CCAP payments. Um, on this. And so part of what we do and look at is to identify errors related to payments issued by CCAP and investigate alleged or suspected financial misconduct by providers. So what we've done over the last several years as part of um, our continuous improvement projects and looking at our processes is utilizing, a, um, developing a standardized process and data to drive and inform our decision making. Um, some of the things that once we do find um, suspected misconduct and or air waste and abuse is that we have the ability to take administrative action or impose sanction in response to our violations. We also um, have the ability to refer cr uh, suspected criminal misconduct to the Minnesota Bureau of cr uh, Criminal Apprehension or the BCA for further investigation. And this is a partnership and collaboration that we have with the BCA and we do provide annual funding to support their efforts at that location <laughs> on that. As you will know, um, I'm gonna move into our next slide, but we do have provided a handout of some of our updates. This is going back to what we've done over the last several years. So it's just a one pager for you to be able to take a look at. Um, just one other thing to note is that these various administrative actions or sanctions that we're able to impose um, do come with appeal and due process rights. So then there are opportunities for those that may not agree or wanna challenge our decision to be able to follow that through. Next slide. So about our team that is um, that handles these um, investigations, and this is a multidisciplinary team that is led by a manager, two supervisors, and ten investigators and an investigative assistant. And their experience and background is very varied. We look for everybody, are looking for team that have administrative investigation background, financial fi uh, banking, financial fraud prevention, law enforcement, auditing, um, and surveillance. And so we have a very well-rounded team here that does take a look at that on it. 
We also work collaboratively within the Office of Inspector General with our licensing division, as well and as well as the CFS or Children's and Family Services Administration when we're taking into account um, the cases that we're taking a look at. Next slide. One of the um, key programs that um, we had developed um, that was established as a result of 2019 bipartisan legislation is our early and often efforts. And it is something that has gone really well and has been working very well. We did delay the implementation of this as we were just starting to kick that all off at the beginning of 2020. So we did delay this um, due to the peacetime emergencies. Um, but we did finally get this moving um, in September of 2021. In this, what this early and often does is provide licensing and CCAP investigation support to a new child care provider in their first year after opening. And this includes educational, TA, um, answering questions and providing that feedback on compliance. Licensing does visits quarterly and then a joint licensing and early and often compliance investigator visits in the third quarter on this. Early and often investigators conducts a third quarter, third quarter attendance review, record review and provides feedback. We've done 144 of these visits since September of 2021. This, what we have noted is that there's been a significant decrease in record keeping errors from the first to the second visits and that we've been receiving um, positive feedback from the providers that have um, gone through this program. Um, so much so that we're looking to, um, as funds and resources allow, to expand this to other provider types on it. Um, our other updates that we have done is we've enhanced our provider communications and engagement um, with our uh, providers once we go out. So part of the information that we leave when we, we are on site is who is requesting the records, what records are being requested, um, what requirements, um, what some of the potential consequences are on it, where to find out more about the CCAP attendance record requirements. We provide a written receipt um, on that and um, as we take a look. So that part of this is not only is when we just show up and um, collect the records that we engage in a conversation with our providers to learn a little bit more about what's going on and for them to understand why we're out here and what we're doing. Um, on this and one of the things that we've done is we've heard from the provider community is we show up we collect records and then they don't hear anything so what we've instituted when we're able to um, notify and recognize providers attendance record reviews that have no compliance violations as well um, on that and that has gone over fairly well we've also um, gone ahead and um, established a new quality assurance a unit within the division. Part of it is, is we want to make sure that we are doing things well um, ourselves. And this is part of one of the recommendations out of the continuous improvement project. So what this allows for us is this will be um, division wide. So this will be not just for our CCAP provider investigations team, but well as, as well as our SIRS, which looks at medical assistance um, provider investigations that making sure that we're consistent, timely, and that our data decisions are, our decisions are data informed on that. Um, and then we're also developing and further developing our metrics and measures to, de to determine the quality and quantity of outputs. And what this will also do is identify any corrective, corrective action and any training needs that we may need internally, but also externally. What, are we, what trends are we seeing? What, what common errors are, are we seeing from providers from the provider community? Because what we've learned is if we can be proactive and we can train on the front end and the money goes out the door correctly, um, that's a really good thing and that's what we're striving for. One of the other things that we've taken on um, since I've last been here through the uh, COVID is the COVID-19 child care grant compliance. And so when all of the grants were quickly being stood up, we were asked to take a look at how would we put in a compliance program? How, do we, how would we do an audit program? And so we formed a new unit um, that would look at provider compliance with the multiple COVID-19 related child care grants. We worked closely with CFS and the Children's Cabinet in developing this. Um, so we have done grants, uh, auditing of our grants for the peacetime emergency child care grants, the COVID-19 pu public health funds for child care, and the child care stabilization grants. I just call these out because each one of them has different um, eligibility requirements, and so we built the, um, the auditing and the compliance structure around each one of the criteria 
And so we've done some proactive auditing for compliance, as well as looking at um, audits after the money has gone out the door on this. And so these audits have been randomly selected and equally distributed across the state throughout the state. We've completed or opened 298 grant audits and only three have resulted in investigation. So the majority of the money and the information that we know is going out the door correctly. One of the other things that um, we have worked to enhance is our enhanced surveillance capability. And these were funds that uh, were allocated in 2019 by the legislature, again, in that bipartisan legislature, to, um, to add to our investigative capabilities. So we've been able to procure an integrated video management and content analysis. So what we do is if it has been determined that um, surveillance may be needed as part of the investigation plan, um, we are able to put up cameras. And then, as you all know, if we're we're having cameras up for uh, two to three weeks that can be hundreds if not thousands of hours of data that I'll collect. And so this tool allows us to be able to um, move through that much more quickly and um, be able to pinpoint people and objects of interest with speed and precision on this. Um, and it does reduce and cut down on our uh, on potential for errors or misidentification on this. Um, so with that, that has been um, very useful as part of our investigative tools. So it's just kind of a highlight of some of the, the activities that had happened in 2022. This is just new data as we've been um, finalizing our 2022 metrics. Um, we had, as I said earlier, 144 early and often visits since September of 2021. Um, we have issued um, 360, just over 360,000 in monetary recoveries. Um, we've taken 57 administrative actions, so this could either be a corrective order or a monetary recovery. Um, we have gone with two administrative disqualifications, and what this means is that a provider is disqualified from participating in the CCAP program and wouldn't be able to bill to us um, on that, and we have suspended payments um, on six, for six different providers. So that is a little highlight of the work that we're doing in our Financial Fraud and Abuse Investigations Div Division, um, CCAP Provider Investigations. Thank so with you. that, I will pause for any questions. Thank you so much, Inspector General. And I should say one, one piece that maybe wasn't so clear in this um, that I was maybe expecting, and so, so perhaps you can provide or we can, is, is a summary of a, a number of the things that we did in 2019. I think there was a sort of an update sheet that we did in 2020 and maybe even just even just as simple as that, we could just get that out to members. We've been working with Ms. Colburn on that. Um, but if you have something, um, Inspector General, that you can provide to get out to members, um, because for folks who haven't been on the committee for a number of years, they may not be aware as much of, of you know, of, of exactly what was done, because um, there really was a ton. So thank you so much for the presentation. Looking for questions, uh, so we'll go with Representative um, uh, Bliss, and then to Representative Lesnar. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> question for you. So I, I followed your, your presentation here. It sounds like you put together a really nice program, a lot of new employees, I would assume, and uh, a lot of good um, procedures and policies. Uh, in 20, was it 2019 or 18, we had the CCAP uh, fraud scandal. It was hundreds of millions of dollars, at least $100 million uh, in fraud. Um, and at that time, what were we at, about 250 million for, for revenue for the, the program? And now we're at 280 some million. Um, how much fraud have you found? Uh, how much uh, are we, I, I see here that you recovered 380 some thousand dollars uh, and suspended two people. Um, well, okay, 57 administrative actions completed and two administrative disqualifications. So there's still uh, roughly $99 million of fraud that's unaccounted for with an increased budget. Are we serving more families? And I may just, just clarify, Representative Bliss, when you ask about the, uh, I think the OLA report found actually they could not substantiate that kind of number of the $100 million. Okay, it was still millions. I think by every standard of measurement, it was still millions of dollars of fraud. So maybe a hundred million dollars was slightly overestimated, but it was still millions in fraud. Um, we're still short a lot, uh, and and we've increased thirty million dollars in revenue to the fund. Um, 
are we serving more families now or uh, just kind of clarify what 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 am i missing did i miss something in the presentation inspector general Thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative. Um, so as uh, Chair Pinto had pointed out, uh, the OLA hadn't been able to substantiate the dollar amount that was going out other than to, I, I believe, say that um, that there was uh, fraudulent activities and monies that were paid fraudulently on that. Um, we had undergone a very con um, extensive continuous improvement project, really looking at that had to um, look at all of our processes and procedures to say what can we do better or where can we change, where can we enhance, um, where can we refine on that. And so um, that's what we have done. We're really looking at being data informed in our decisions, looking at the data, looking at outliers um, on that um, <coughs> as well um, on that. So uh, what we're also trying to do is m ensure that the money goes out the door correctly, which is why we have our early and often program so that the there is no fraud, waste, and abuse or errors so, so that the money is going out correctly. So I do think that we're seeing the benefits of that as well um, as we have added a few new, um, new providers um, over um, the last se uh, several years on it. Um, I can't always say for certain that there isn't fraud, waste, and abuse, but I feel like we're very comfortable that we have a team in place that is taking a look at that, is being able to do that, and we're utilizing all of the tools um, for that. Um, I do believe we are serving more families. That is a number that I would have to confirm with our CF my CFS um, colleagues, but I do think we are serving more families, hence the increase um, in the money. Uh, Representative Bliss. Okay, Representative Lesnikar. Thank you, Chair Pinto. And to a follow-up of the last question, I guess money going out quickly is not a problem, and I understand the importance of this. I guess I would be more supportive of localizing control for these monies, you know, finding ways within the counties where people know the providers. It's not possible, in my mind, for um, the state government to possibly manage the, the amount of grants, but it, the needs are there, and so having audits with fiscal responsibility and, you know, none of us want to have money going out to children not fed or any other program. So it, it, finding methods where we can assure that at a local level of unit there are control systems. And I think in committees I've listened to GHS say that they are struggling with the number of staff and there are have been gaps for various reasons. and. And I'm not finger pointing, but I do think it's something to think about. What does DHS and the state have to monitor, and what can be done locally? Whether it's through our school districts, through our counties, you know, what possibilities are there, and is this the best plan? I have great concern that we're going to have another opportunity for fraud, waste, and abuse at, in millions, and we all have to answer to the people of Minnesota, and I, this makes me nervous and uncomfortable that we don't have clear guidance that the past problems have been fixed. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Lesnikar. Um, Inspector General, you have a response regarding that? Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative. I will say that um, as part of our county delegated system, our uh, CCAP provider investigation team does work with the counties, and the counties are able to also um, do provider investigations. Um, as, you, as you pointed out, um, the counties are closer and know the providers in the community um, better than um, some of us do. So we do work with them, and they do have that ability. and. Um, and so I just wanted to go ahead and note with that um, that we, we do have that and we would um, are always working to increase that relationship with our county partners. And, and uh, Inspector General, to the point of local control, in CCAP is a county administered program. Um, so in fact, there is that, that local control. Right. Um, yes, Mr. Chair, um, it is. And we do get referrals from our um, CCAP um, Actually, let me just step that back. We do get um, referrals from our uh, child care, family child care licensors that are set at the, the county level because that's part of our county delegated system. And so they work um, closely and do refer out to the whatever investigative provider investigative um, section of the county um, staff that they have there. So there, there, is, um, there is collaboration and work there at the county level. 
Thank you, Inspector General. And I really would urge members, uh, this is, our, I think, our fourth update for those who have been on the committee for a number of years on this. And I might urge members, maybe Ms. Colburn, we can send this out um, to see the hearing, which was the, was the first update now three years ago in, uh, in uh, January of 2020. Because um, so I think members on, on both sides uh, were really, really impressed with where things stood. And then, of course, you've made so many more advances even more since then. So thank you so much for this update. Um, not looking, not seeing other hands, and so thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, Representative Davis, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Inspector General Modi. Um, I just want to come back to the um, former uh, DHS employee who kind of blew the whistle that there was $100 million in fraud happening every or annually. Um, do you agree with uh, the investigators uh, that said that $100 million was a fair estimate, um, even though it couldn't be itemized. Was, was, do you agree with the investigators? They said it was a, it was a fair uh, estimate of $100 million in fraud. Do you agree with that? And, and Representative Davis, you're not talking about the OLA investigators. You're talking about these some the internal folks, or can you just clarify the question? Um, The Office of Legislative Assistant, or I'm sorry, the the, um, the OLA, um, they agreed that the hundred million dollars was a fair estimate in the fraud uh, in the CCAP program. I'm not sure that's correct. But I guess Inspector General, please. Well, okay. L l I'm sorry. Let me rephrase the question. Please, Representative Davis. Do you believe that's a fair estimate that a hundred million dollars of fraud happened, Inspector General? Um, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative, um, I um, don't necessarily think that it's that high, but we do have the data to, um, or we, we are data informed when we're making those decisions. Um, it wasn't substantiated at the time when both the OLA came in and upon further um, discussions and look at the program. So um, um, I'm not willing to confirm to or I'm not going to say that it's uh, at the hundred million because that that's going to be close or if not um, most of our CCAP program and so we're not saying that you know almost half of our CCAP program is fraudulently going out the door. Uh, Representative Davis. Yes thank you Mr. Chair thank you um, just a follow-up question what do you think is a fair estimate in your opinion? Inspector General. Mr. Chair, uh, members of the uh, representative, um, that, that's, a, that's a difficult question to answer. We know that there's fraud, waste, and abuse. That's not necessarily saying that things are going out the door fraudulently, but there may be waste or abuse or error that could be occurring. We do monitor that um, as best that we can, working with our county partners. So it's difficult to put a number um, on that. Um, and so I'm not really able to say that right this time. Thank you. And I guess, um, Representative Davis, I'm, I'm looking at the OLA report, which says, quote, we did not find evidence to substantiate the allegation that the level of CCAP fraud in Minnesota is $100 million annually. So uh, what that's correct. But just, Davis. To, just to clarify, Mr. Chair, um, I, I do believe they said it was a fair estimate. Uh, and I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, if, um, if you find that in the report, yeah, please um, point that out. I'm, I'm not, not aware of that. Representative Hudson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Inspector General, thank you for your presentation as I consider the back and forth here regarding the exact number of CCAP fraud from a few years back it seems to me that the lack of clarity on that question is indicative of the problem um, we never got an itemized list of the fraudulent acts that took place which seems to indicate that we don't have the capacity or the capability to accurately identify whether or not activity fits into that waste, fraud, or abuse category. We have these enhancements that you've outlined. Can you provide any specific examples that provide you with confidence that going forward, we'll be able to not only detect when waste, fraud, and abuse is happening, but we'll be able to quantify it so that we have solid numbers going forward? Inspector General. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative. Um, part of some of the um, difficulty being able to share information on it in real time is that um, anything that is 
considered an urge part of an open investigation is private data. So it makes it difficult to be able to share what, um, what is currently going on or, or what um, activities or investigations that or identified fraud, waste or abuse that we have because on that. So anytime um, data is going to um, lag on as to that respect. Um, I will say that um, we are building out our performance metrics and um, which is why we have the quality assurance team um, on there as well as we have uh, spun out an office of data and analytics within the office of inspector general so that we can be able to provide that dashboard and that information that you're asking on that part of it is um, as, a, as the agency's response during the pandemic is we put a lot of pause on certain things and we, we moved to desk audits and um, virtual audits, which um, in some respects are can be a good thing. It's another tool that we're utilizing within our, our toolbox, um, but it isn't, um, it isn't as being on site on that. So as we're, we're, we're standing those back up and re-engaging back on that, part of what we wanna do is being able to build out those dashboards and be able to provide you with that information. But um, anything real time, uh, we're not gonna be able to share because of the um, data classifications around that. Representative Hudson, open, okay, thank you. Representative Katiza Wittoon. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, as, a, as a member who was on the committee when we, we did pass um, some of the improvements and additional funding for um, additional child care uh, program investigators, da data analysts, et cetera, et cetera, including two law enforcement officers to continue to con uh, conduct that criminal CCAP investigation person. I, I, I really appreciate that you, that you, you know, have given us this, the chart and in terms of the investigations from 20, 2021. Um, you know, the fraud was five years ago. I'm glad that we found it. I think you know that it's really important that we consider the changes that the legislature, this this the previous committee has come together and made, and that your office has implemented since then. I think you know it's important to we to we ensure that history doesn't repeat itself. But I think it's one thing to continue parroting data that wasn't true through the media. Um, the office found no actual quantification of the amount that <coughs> keeps being repeated. Um, it's just not, it's not helpful. And I think one thing that we really do need to consider is that our CCAP rates are drastically below average. I mean, the, the, <coughs> the biggest problem with CCAP integrity is that we're not paying providers what they need to be paid and we have constant waiting lists because families are continuing to to need these services. So um, I, I just appreciate the work that you're doing and in terms of supporting families and ensuring that um, we're gonna avoid these sorts of numbers going forward. Thank you. Um, Inspector General, thank you so much. Oh, Representative Daniels, yeah. And then we, we, we should wrap up soon. Representative Lee Daniels, please. Uh, thank you, Chair Pinto. Thank you, uh, Inspector General, for being here. This is my awkward sitting stage. I'm trying to figure out how to do this. Um, uh, thank you for being here and um, I, I'm, I, I relate to what President Katisto Tuner said, we do need more funding, we need to have families that are on the waiting mm -hmm. list. But until we know what happened in the past and we have solid numbers, I'm a little leery of going forward. I think two of our representatives asked basically how much fraud was 100 million, you know, close, because that's what the report from the OLA said, uh, it could be up to $100 million. And, um, and we haven't gotten a number of what's actually been found of fraudulent charges. So between zero and $100 million, there's some fraud in there, and I'd be very uncomfortable uh, sending more money out unless we knew that we found the money that was taken illegitimately. And because of that and some ties to the Feeding Our Future fraud, which is the biggest scandal in the United States for federal uh, assistance. Um, it makes, a, I think, all of us very leery and want to pump the brakes before more money goes out until we know, you know, where we're at, how much was lost. You know, we've had 380,000 recovered, but if it's 50 million or if it's, you know, 100 million, that's, that's just a drop in the bucket. So. Um, can I get your response on that? I just want to know if there's any way to find out how much fraud there actually was uh, in those years. Inspector General. Um, Mr. Chair, Representative, can I just ask one clarifying? You're asking in the years since 2018, 2019? Uh, 
Yeah. Uh, Lee Daniels, yes, yes uh, Inspector General. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative. Um, on that, um, as Chair Pinto had noted, we do have um, some of the handouts that we had provided with some of our metrics. Um, going back to, I will see if we have the one. Uh, see if we have one on 2018, but I know we have one for 2019, 2020. On that, and so we can share some of the um, the metrics um, that we have there and what what had been identified and or what had been referred over to our um, partners at the BCA looking at the criminal um, investigations on that um, and just being said that being said you know any understanding that with the feeding our future um, scandal that has been out there and the findings from that um, we um, take that really seriously. We take a look at that and we see what else is happening outside in other agencies. Is that, what can we learn from that? What can we do? Um, we, if um, one of the takeaways that we have from that is that we need to continue to move quickly and investigate any possible um, fraud, waste, and or abuse or error um, on that. And so, um, um, that's what we're doing and we continue to build out our processes and, and to continue to monitor things quickly So we we are paying attention to all of those things and see what we can learn from other um, programs and other um, Agencies that uh, within the state so that we can continue to adapt and um, Move quickly on that so that we ensure that um, There isn't any or that we can limit the number of uh, Pardon me, so that sure that we can um, identify and recover or take action on any fraud, waste, and abuse. Again, what we have found has been our best um, mechanism on this is to being proactive and, and working with um, providers and um, the provider community about how the money goes out so that, and, and having that contact early on. And so um, the early and often program has been um, <laughs> really good in, in that, and so that, that is the, the, the best way to make sure that the money goes out the door correctly. Lee Daniels, and I represent the Legends Carry something too, Lee Daniels. Just a quick follow-up, yeah, uh, Chair, thank you. Um, well, I appreciate that, but we're, we're still in that cloudy gray area, and before I think any of my members go forward, we'd sure like to get some, some numbers from that, so we'll try <coughs> that. Another question, I think it might have been covered in the presentation, but how many ongoing investigations are currently being done for the CCAP program? Uh, Ms. Uh, Inspector General, please. Mr. Chair, um, Representative, I can't um, answer that question because ongoing and open investigations are considered private data. And so I'm not able to share that at this time. Uh, uh, Lee Daniels. No. I'm just surprised because I didn't, I didn't ask for specifics. I just asked for how many investigations are going on. So I'm, I'm I'm not sure why we couldn't answer that. So and Inspector General, you're not able to provide the number of ongoing investigations. Correct. Correct. Okay. Okay. Um, now we can uh, represent Ms. Lesnikar. Thank you, Chair Pinto, and thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask on the 360,158 for monetary recovery, as a new member and maybe for other members, it would be helpful to know the breakdown. What is this from? And and when we recovered it what systems were put in place to tie to uh, the recovery? Inspector General. Mr. Chair, um, Representative, um, we'll have to get, um, get back to you. I'm sorry, I can't actually see you. So I'm oh, I can't see oh. you, sorry. <laughs> we'll, we'll, have to, um, we'll have to get back to you on that information. We'll have somebody follow up with you on that. I don't have that with me at this time. Thank you. If you could get back to us on, on those things too, um, and clearly an ongoing conversation. Um, members, uh, uh, before, so Inspector General, you can just stay there. I'm not gonna call um, Mr. Hosh, um, but I do wanna highlight for members that we have um, a presentation about uh, regulation modernization. I'm gonna try to have Mr. Hosh come back in, um, but I did wanna just highlight for members in terms of the work of the division overseen by Ms. Baum, um, that there is this effort going on right now to assess uh, and to modernize the child care regulations. I know that's something that's of interest to both members of both parties and to be aware that we uh, are investing quite a bit to reform those and to the extent that members have concerns about the regulations in child care, they are in fact um, being reformed. Mm -hmm. There's also as part of that um, a study regarding alternative li child care licensing models that just came out and I'd urge members to take a look at that as well um, as we're making decisions about child care funding, et cetera. Um, members, we are just about at time um, I'm, uh, we've passed one, uh, just a couple notes. We've passed the one bill today with uh, funding before July 1. 
Um, I'm planning to move through the committee um, several funding proposals um, with both a similar perspective. We had House File 150 that we heard last week, um, trying to get people childcare and, and uh, early learning right away, um, and then also to address some issues that um, we've been uh, considering for several years and that we want to make sure that we can get moving on to try to start to stabilize this really, really broken sector. Um, so keep an eye out for that. Um, and in particular on Thursday, we'll be, uh, I plan to be hearing House File 150 again. Uh, and also a proposal to address um, the, the very low uh, CCAP rates that we have that Representative Katiza Ratoon alluded to. So um, members keep in touch, and uh, uh, with that we are adjourned. Many thanks.